Welcome to our JavaScript interactive course. In this course we're going to be covering a lot of what is done within the DOM, how it works. Uh, so this is the JavaScript DOM and what it does is it takes in all the different elements that are available under document. Uh, so it takes in anything under HTML, head, uh, titles, my titles, and so on. So all of this is accessible within the DOM and it does work like kind of like a tree where you've got the base of it and then all the different branches that build out from the DOM. So uh, once again document object model DOM so we've got HTML head body uh, and then we've got H1 paragraphs and all the way down. So it provides a structured representation of the document uh, essentially, as a, we said before, a tree defines a way that the structure can be accessed from programs so that they can change the document structure style and content. So throughout the DOM, you can access any one of these elements and make changes with it and make it more interactive for the users of the web content. So one of the questions is, why would you want to use JavaScript to update CSS? and HTML when it's easier just code goes into uh, the website when you're creating it. Uh, so that's a very valid question because uh, within the DOM you are actually manipulating the CSS and HTML so why wouldn't you just code that in in the first place. So we've got all these different users that are coming to your website and they're expecting to get some kind of unique interaction and that's what the DOM can provide. It can provide uh, working with the DOM API, you can respond to the user, customize the web page experience, and make it so that not every web page, every web user has the same experience. They have a customized interactive experience that's all their own. Uh, so events that the user does can also determine what they see on the page, and this is what makes the DOM extremely powerful and makes JavaScript. Uh, accessing the DOM and the API have a whole bunch of options that you can really do with it. Uh, so different users would have their own dynamic customized experience. Uh, the website would change depending on the events that the user was taking and not as much uh, what was already preset. So as an example if we do have a button the user clicks the button and you can have any number of things happen and changing the website to be totally different uh, depending on what you want to accomplish with that button change. Uh, it opens up the door to so many options, it's limitless. You can work with games, uh, you can make forms, really infor validating forms and interactive forms. Uh, you can work with image galleries, so it's very common to use the DOM for image galleries and a whole bunch of stuff that you can do with the DOM. So basically making your web pages interactive and that's what we're going to be running through on this course. When you're bringing in JavaScript to your web website you've got two options to bring in JavaScript. So you can do a tag like this. You can do script, source, and have a source for the JavaScript. So this one is actually on the same root folder, so it's uh, my JavaScript. So I've just got that source here, and as you can see, I've got some JavaScript in there. So regardless whether I'm calling in a source file or if I'm posting the code within the same page, it's gonna work the same way. So if I remove this out, and if I load up the page, you can see that it actually does run the same thing. It runs the hello world, runs, writes hello, and it puts hello into the console. So that's what the code here is doing. Uh, we're gonna get into this as well in more detail within later parts of this course and later lessons about get element by ID and inner HTML as well as console. Uh, so basically what we're doing here, we're doing console log, so we're calling out hello and then here we're setting a variable x holding a string hello and down here we've got document get element by id and we're looking for this id and we're assigning inner html and then of course we're using the variable x over here so it's assigning this text within id1 so it's the same thing as if we're attaching the script source 
So usually by best practice, the best thing is to source out your JavaScript files so it leads to cleaner code, uh, so it is more readable code. Um, and you can see here that within the myjavascript.js files, so you always got to remember to name them JS files, I've got the exact same code and it's going to interact with that element ID and assign that inner HTML even though it's sitting on a separate file that's outside of this lesson one HTML file. And once, uh, so I did save that, and once I refresh the page, you can see that the result is the exact same. And it really is better to keep the files separate, although within this course, we're gonna be listing out the JavaScript as we've uh, shown here by doing script open and close tags, uh, just because it's gonna be easier for us to go through the lesson and to go back and forth and see what code is interacting with what HTML code. As well, if you've got some small JavaScript, uh, sometimes you can get away with just putting the code down here, but if you've definitely, if you're running into long lines of code and if you've got a lot of JavaScript, the best practice is to create a separate JS file. The last video we briefly looked at console log and what you can do. So console log is just a default action that can send a message over to the console. So the console again, it's a developer's console where you see messaging uh, that's not meant for web display. Uh, so it's just a way to kind of communicate back information uh, for development purposes. As you can see here, I've got several different types of console log messages. So you're probably most familiar with just console log, uh, but you do have some options with console log and uh, it's a way to make it a little bit more colorful as well. So you've got console info, console warn, console debug, and console error. And as you can see here, they're coming up in different formats. So the debug is blue, the error is red, the warning is yellow, the info has the eye, and then the console log is just plain. And if you want to really get fancy with your console log messages, you can actually set the color, you can set the font, and you can do some additional styling to it. So I've got I see Smurfs, and that should actually be blue for the Smurfs. And when I refresh that, you can see that it's blue. Uh, you can do green as well. Uh, purple so just picking a styling color and that adds some additional styling so if you really want to highlight out a message a console log message uh, this is a great way to do that as well you can also set the background uh, which is also another way to really highlight out that color that you're looking for it's just going to be simple CSS where I'm changing background green font weight bold and gonna just say I see the Hulk for green and we'll just see what happens and as you can see here this really does highlight out that console message so it makes it a lot more I guess uh, user-friendly when you're developing within it what's known as the DOM is going to be the key to making your web pages interactive with JavaScript the DOM is also, it's short for Document Object Model, so D-O-M, uh, and it's known as the DOM. And what the DOM is, the whole contents of the web page, so everything between the body, so the document body, uh, so this would contain everything that's contained within the DOM, and all of these different nodes, the styles, the attributes, the inner HTML, can be controlled through the DOM. JavaScript, when the page loads within the browser, JavaScript is able to access the DOM and control all the different attributes and all the different items within the DOM. So the browser will look at all of this content and look at it as one object. And the document is actually gonna be all the HTML that's within that web, web page. That means that everything within the DOM is going to be organized within a hierarchical model. So if you do have something like this, 
the DOM is going to take all of that in and it's going to bring that in with a hierarchy model. So everything within the window is going to be the top level and this is going to be the utmost element of the DOM hierarchy. Next it's going to be the document object. So each HTML document that gets loaded into window becomes a document object. The document contains the contents of the page. So all of this stuff is going to be contents of the page. And then it's broken down even further. So if you've got forms, you've got form objects, and then you can control all the different, you can access and control all the different objects on the page. It's a little bit more complex HTML. We see that there's a whole bunch of different objects on this page, and all of this gets loaded in within the DOM, and it's accessible using DOM to be able to access all these different HTML objects. So within this course, we're going to be going over and we're going to be using inner HTML quite a bit, as well as we're going to be using text content. So it's important to understand the difference between the two. So over here, we've got a few examples. And up at the top here, we have some HTML code that is running that's making it bold, as well as adding in a new line, as well as the second one here. And then the third one, we actually were seeing all the HTML content. So the difference within the code is going to be what we've done here. So we've got three paragraph with different IDs and we're setting a variable X to equal this, this string that also contains some HTML code. And in the first one, what we're doing is we're just outputting that string. So it's the exact same thing as X. Uh, the second one we're actually using x, the variable x, and you see that this information when you do inner HTML as well as if you do text content, this string is going to stay the same uh, using the variable is going to be the same thing so as writing it out over here. Uh, so it is a shorter and a better way to do it when you use variables because this actually does cut down on rewriting. So if I did actually have to rewrite this particular string, this particular variable information several times as I've done down here, just calling it x is a lot simpler than rewriting all of this code. So it does look a lot neater. Uh, so besides that, we're looking at inner HTML and text content. And we see the differences here that even though we're calling the same variable and it's got the exact same content within it, the output is different. And for obvious reasons, inner HTML is actually running the HTML code in the string, whereas text content is just seeing it as text content, as uh, the name indicates, and it's only displaying it as text content. So it's removing out all this. Well, it's not removing out, but it's not running all this HTML code, and it's leaving it as is. So when we go back to the example, we see that the first one is just the copied string uh, and it's inner HTML. The second one is inner HTML as well. And then the third one is text content. And we see the difference in the output. So throughout this course, we're going to be using different variations. And when we only want to output text content, we're going to be using text content. And if we do want to adjust the HTML within a particular element, uh, we're going to be using inner HTML. So now we're going to start getting interactive with JavaScript's document object model. And as we can see here from the previous slides, we've got document, we've got HTML, we've got headers, body, title, and we've got access through the DOM API to all of these different elements. And we can select them and change them as needed. The DOM is in a tree type format where we've got code, which has access to other branches and it just keeps branching out till it reaches the end of the code that's available within the page. So when we look at this particular example, there's not a lot of content here, but if we go to the page source, we see that there's quite a lot of HTML content. So what's happening here is that we're actually overwriting all of the page content using JavaScript. 
and when we we're actually console logging out the document and we can see that all of this HTML code is actually sitting within the document and we do have access to all of it if we can get it out into the console then we do have access to it and now that we're going to look at the code we see the reason that we're only seeing new web page content is because we've got this document body and we're setting the inner HTML to be equal to the string. So all, that's all it's going to be writing. So if I actually wanted to hash that out and I'm going to actually unhash this one. Uh, so all this one is doing get element by ID selecting the header element. I'm thinking back to what, the way the DOM works and the way the DOM is structured. So we've got our document We've got our elements, head elements, and what that was doing, that was just selecting the body element, and it was changing the content of the body element, thus voiding all of these other elements that are on the branch further down. Uh, so now that we've removed that, we're going to only look for the header element, which when we do look over here, we see that it is, uh, so it's within the body's branches, and it's going down quite a bit here, uh, into the body. Uh, so we've got container and then it's one of the branches within container. It's called header. So ID of header and so we're going to be selecting this content here and changing the inner HTML to welcome to my world. So right now within the source code it says welcome to my website and we're just going to go back over to the page, refresh that, and you can see all the content is back. We're no longer overwriting the content in the body and it's welcome to my world. So instead of welcome to my website, welcome to my world. And by now I think that you should be able to see that all the different options that we're starting to get with uh, working within the DOM and all the exciting things that we can do with it by selecting any one of these elements on the page within the HTML code. We can adjust it, we can play with it, we can get that information and we can actually also in later lessons we're going to show you how to really get interactive with that. So this is the beginning of starting to get interactive with the JavaScript DOM. One of the common questions about JavaScript is, why do we add it to the bottom of the page? Because we could very likely just take it, place it within the head, because as you might already know that you can not actually place JavaScript within the head here. And yes, there are some cases where you're going to need to place the JavaScript up at the top if you're calling them uh, from functions and if you've got a particular reason for placing it near the top. So there are definitely cases where you do need to place it in the top, but for the most part good practice is to place it in the bottom. So we've got just the same code that we've copied over, pasted over, and we're just going to refresh the page and we're going to see what happens and we see that we do get an error. And the error here is cannot set property inner HTML of null. So what we're trying to do within this code we're trying to get element by ID and header. Uh, so generally a good idea is when you do create interactive JavaScript, you're going to be placing it in the bottom. Because the reason that we're getting that error is because JavaScript, uh, the, the, the page is loading, the browser is running the code on the page, so it's starting here at the top, getting here, hitting the JavaScript and saying, okay, console log document. So it prints out the document information. So that's just over here. We see that it does load quite a bit of document stuff, but there's a lot of null stuff as well. And when we get down here at document get element by ID, and we're looking for header, header doesn't actually exist yet because this HTML code isn't written yet and the browser hasn't read through that yet. And that's why it's producing the error because we're trying to set the inner HTML of header to this string and header doesn't exist yet. Uh, so we do get an error. So this is why when you're doing interactive JavaScript because you're going to be interacting with the code at the top, it's always best to keep it at the bottom. And this goes for the same thing when you're actually including uh, the source files. So don't place them at the top 
although you can and you'll notice that sometimes they do place libraries at the top uh, best practice is to keep it down here keep all the code together and list out the sources as well uh, so it gives the time it gives time for the dom to load and that information to get within the dom in order to get access to it so good rule of thumb is to kind of think of javascript as well as uh, front-end code including html and css to run within uh, a progression, a run within step, it's a linear fashion, so it doesn't load all together, it does load one piece at a time, and it has to hit that piece in order to get access to it and interact with it. In the previous lessons, when we're setting inner HTML or we're sending the inner the text there, the text content, what we've been using, we've been using document, get element by ID, selecting the element name and then doing dot inner html and selecting the source so this is what we've been doing previously so something like this where we do document dot get element by id header inner html welcome to javascript and this is what we've been using but there is actually a better way more efficient way to set up that dom element and be able to access all the different properties so once again, once you do pick up the, that element information, it operates kind of like an array, kind of like an object, where you're able to set, set it as a variable and then access that variable and set all the different functionality, the access the DOM API and interact with the content. So here we're doing the same thing as we're doing up here, but it does look a lot cleaner. And if we're doing more than just sending inner HTML to the element, we're gonna be able to access that and it'll look a lot cleaner in the end. As well here, we've written out my uh, console log, the my element, so we can pick up all the information that's available within this object. So here when we refresh the page, we see that within the that h1 header ID we've got all of this information that we can access so there's various whole bunch of different objects that we have access to and a whole bunch of different text information so we've got the inner HTML welcome to JavaScript we've got the inner text welcome to JavaScript we've got the ID as header We've got the positioning of where it's located. We also have outer HTML. So we've got the whole element there, the H1 ID equals header. We've got the outer text, welcome to JavaScript. And we just do have a whole bunch of information that we now have access to. We also have the scroll information, parents, node, child, siblings, and we're going to get into that in later lessons as well. So now you can see how powerful the DOM really is and how much access to information you really have and what you can really get to, to do when you get, uh, get working with the power of the, the DOM. So splitting this up, the inner HTML, we can see that that's fairly straightforward there and it's outputting that text and content. And we can see here when we go over to console log and we just picked up one of the different elements that was available within the DOM, outer HTML, and we're just going to console log that out. And when we refresh the page, we do see that we've got that outer HTML that was listed there. And so now we can set that and use that as a variable a value and all from just now typing my element dot inner HTML so we don't have to constantly do this get element by ID uh, which is bad practice if you're going to be con constantly calling to it uh, the best practice is to call to it one time get that information onto a variable and then use that variable to access all the different objects and information available within that object for the first few lessons, we've been using get element by ID. So that works really well if you've got an ID. But what if we want to get something like span here? We want to get the entire span and 
it doesn't have an ID. And then we look at class and we see that there's, this div has the same class as these spans. So we want to just isolate it out to these three different elements here. Span, class first, they're all span, class first, but they're all spans. So if we want to pick out the different spans, we can do get elements by tag name. And you notice that we do have an S here. So there are multiple elements, possibility of multiple ele elements within this particular tag. Uh, so which is the case over here where we do actually have three of them. Uh, so we're just going to run this code here. Uh, we're going to console log out. So because spans, there's multiple items that are being returned. Uh, it's getting placed in. It's going to function as an array. And if we want to get the first item in the array, we do zero. So by default, it will be zero. And if we want to get the span length, then we can just do dot length. And that's going to return the length of the span. And this is something that we're going to need when we're doing our loop here below, where we're looping through all the different elements within the span, and we're using the length of it. And then we're going to console log out all the different items within this array called my spans, and we're just going to count through it while the length is less than the full length of the spans. So let's uh, check that out within Chrome. So we see when we do load this page, it loads all of this information to the console. So this is our original get element by ID. So it's picking up the header there. And then here, we're picking up the first span, which is change these so we can have can two, can one, and can three. So we actually do see a difference when we reload it. And we're just going to load that as well. And we see that can one. So this is the first item within that array. It's returning that. So it's returning out all the information there as can one. And then when it's checking out how many items are placed within the array, it sees three. And here it just loops through all three different items. That works really well. And what if we just wanted to look at the ones that are class first? So we're going to have to find another way to access those. And the code for that is get elements by class name. So we're going to actually pick out all the different classes that are called first. We're going to check the length of it as we did before, uh, seeing that there's going to be a whole bunch of classes, that's elements, that are going to be returned. So we're just calling them my first, so it's going to create an array. Then we're going to loop through the array and see what gets returned. So when I refresh this, we can see here that here's where our last one ended. So now we're returning four items, because if you remember that we had a div as well that was falling into uh, class as first. So it was taking this item here that was first. So we see that this was the first span or class called first. This is the second class called first. This is the third class called first. And then our fourth class called first is this entire div here. Because uh, the spans were a lot smaller than the divs there. They only really held a couple characters or several characters within them. And then we had the div class that held this entire string of content. So even if it's only returning one item, it's still going to be an array and it's going to be an array that can be listed out as we did over here with the tags. So depending on what method you want to use to find the content that you want to find, uh, you would pick either get element by ID, get elements by tag name, or get elements by class name. And you can see it's all camel case, so each word, so the first word is all lowercase. The second word has starts with a capital uppercase. The next word starts with a capital uppercase, and and so on. And that's the same for all the different functions here, the methods that are available. You always have to remember that syntax is important in JavaScript. Even if you change something like this, you're going to see that it's no longer going to function, and you're going to get the error there. Uh, because this isn't a proper function within JavaScript.
The challenge for this video is going to be to work with what we learned in the last video, how we can change classes, how we can pick up the different class information within our console, write that out. Now what we want to do is we want to actually change the inner HTML so that it looks something like this where we've got number one has class first, two has a class first, three has a class first, four has a class first. So it's counting and then just putting in a string there has a class first. So when you open up the challenge which is lesson 7a HTML file, when you open that up you're going to see that we've written out the challenge here and we've kept the code essentially the same from the previous course that we just went through, the class that we went through. And what we want to do is we want to look at get element by class name because we want to pick up all the ones that have a class of first. So if you want to pause the video, download the file and try to work out a solution for that. And once you come back, we're just going to be going through the solution right now as well. Uh, so the solution for this is going to be to add the array item there so that remember we had talked about this that this places it within that array so array item number or i which is going to start out at zero so it's going to take the first item within my firsts and it's going to treat it as an object so you're going to have the ability to change the inner html and what we've done here we've just bolded it so that it stands out when we're looking at it we've got a count so we're taking account of i, we're adding 1 to it so it doesn't start at 0, and then we're just adding this string has a class of first. So that's going to be the solution to this challenge, and that's lesson 7a HTML. I encourage that you try it out, as well as work with some variations of it to see what you can make happen. You can also, in addition, play around with the tags, as well as the element by ID to change those around as well if you want additional practice on this topic. This video we're going to be looking at complex CSS selectors. So if we had a whole bunch of spans and we only want to pull out the spans with the class of first, so let's look at our code now. So if we actually had an additional span it was called first but we had that within a div and we want to find the first three here but we don't want to return the fourth one so I'll just show that right here so even though I've added in that additional one that's exactly the same except it's being held within a div it's not returning that one. And the reason is that we've changed it to query selector all. And it's using a more specific CSS selector. So it's going by paragraph and then it's selecting the class of first. So this is the same as if you're writing CSS for that, if you're writing some styling. Remember to identify all of those within and within CSS, change the color to red. We can also use the same thing when we're using query selector all and identify the CSS this way and it only returns the same ones that we had colored red within the CSS. So if we change this to div and did the same in the, J in the JavaScript and then refresh the page you can see that it's only going to return that one element. And that's how you write query selector all. Uh, so this is a little bit more complex than the previous ones so if you do have a choice and if you are just looking to use by ID get element by tags and get elements by class. 
Uh, so if you are able to use those, those are preferable, but if you're not able to return that specific element, uh, you can specify it here within the CSS selector. And then we've got another one that we're going to briefly mention as well, that uh, query selector. And so what this does is this only returns one element. Uh, so it's very similar if you're using get element by ID. Uh, so that would be a preferable way to return the same result here uh, instead of using query selector, but you are able to use query selector if the need be, or if it makes more sense within the coding. And again, look at the syntax. So it's query selector all, and then within the rounded brackets and quotes, you've got the tag there and then the class identified. And it's the same thing as you would do within CSS. So within this challenge, what we want to do is change this div to say some text. So I've just changed it to has a class of first and leave all the other ones that have a class of first without change. So what we're going to look at is the HTML that we're presented with. And we see here that class first, there's a div inside of there. And we want to be able to grab all of this information and change that. But we don't want to change all the class firsts to whatever our text string is going to be. And we also have to be careful that there's an additional div down here that's also that we want to leave and that we don't want to change because it doesn't even have the class of first. So what we want to do first is we want to use our CSS selector. So if you want to pause the video and download lesson 8.8 .8, lesson 8a.html and use that as a source file in order to solve this challenge. So the first step that you want to do is go to set up a variable and use the query selector all and then select out the same thing that you have here within the CSS. So I'm identifying the class of first and the div inside is going to be colored red. So that's going to be exactly like we have here within the HTML code. We see that we've been able to select this out and isolate it out using CSS. And at that point, we use query selector all to write that out. And we see here that to enter in the console log. And then when we refresh it, we see here that it is selecting that div and it's getting all that information that's available within that div. See that the outer HTML, we can scroll all the way over and we can see what the inner HTML is. And what we want to do is we want to list that out and change it. So in case there was to be additional ones, so this one, in this example, we're only finding one value that's being returned within this array of my firsts. But just in case we do end up adding additional ones, we want to be able to loop through all the array. And here we do have, we're going to show each item within the array. And then here we're setting the inner HTML, much like we did in our last challenge, where we're setting it to account and we're just writing has a class of first. So once we save that, and refresh it, we can see that we're able to accomplish this challenge. So with the query selector, you have some additional options as well. So here we've just got a couple links. And as you can see here, when you look down in the bottom left hand corner, this goes to google.com forward slash question mark s equals js ajax. And then here we've got just forward slash question mark s equals js. 
So these are going to two separate links and if we want to actually access those links using the query selector and change those links this is going to be the code to do that. As we can see here we've already got that code or those elements selected that are a tags, href, and we're looking at what the href value is. So any of the values that includes js, it'll change that. If I change this to just ajax, it will no longer include the second one, it'll just include the first one. So in order to write this out in JavaScript, we can find that using the query selector all and here we've got the same syntax where we're searching out for a tag, href, and we're searching for all that equals, and don't forget to put the forward slash because we do have the quotes there, so we have to forward slash them out. Uh, so all that equals or contains JS within it. So here's we've got JS, here we've got JS, and what we're actually going to do, we're going to change the href value of all of these objects and we're going to change it to google.com question mark s equals changed. So that's going to change it for both of these URLs and as you can see here the href URL they're both different and they both have different values here. So when I refresh the page we can see that this has changed in the bottom left hand corner you see it is going to that URL and you can see that as well in that additional one. So when we do go, we click it, we see that it, it clicks through to the changed URL that's changed. We remove out the asterisks and we just put a hard-coded URL there. So what it's going to do, it's just going to look for this one. So if the value is equal to that, we can see that when we refresh it, this one stays the same because this one's value is different, it's JS Ajax, and then this one was just the JS, so it, it does actually only change that one. So there's a couple different ways to write that out and to find that CSS selector, and it works in conjunction with the same coding that works within styling, it's going to work as well down here. So in this lesson, we have a challenge for you. And you can use the source files from lesson 9a and write out this challenge. We've also got the challenge written within there as well as in with the description of this lesson. Uh, so within this challenge, what we want to do and what we want to accomplish, we want to write out the h ref link URL. So we've got a bunch of links, well several, couple of links here and we want to write out the full link information and as you can see when you do go to the source code you're not going to actually see that information being written out. We just have the link there and we've got just JS here we've got everything uh, and what we want to do is we want to use JavaScript in order to update these links to say click this link to go to and then list out the URL that's listed. And we're going to have the answer within the file so 9a.html is going to contain the answer uh, and we're going to also do a 9a or 9q with just the question without the answer code with it. So again, uh, this is going to be the code, and if you want to pause the video, try to take up this challenge. Uh, you can also click through the link to the editable code, and that will give you the ability to edit the code on, on a live, uh, live site, and you can see how the code's going to work within there. Uh, so the solution that we do have for this problem is that we want to keep, we want to look at all the links and we only want to include the links that include JS. So here we have um, part of the challenge was to only include links that include JS within the link URL. 
So here we do have JS, there we have JS. So it's going to grab both of these links. And the way that we're doing that is we're using a query selector all. And the way that the query selector all works is it's going to work in the same way as CSS would work. Uh, so here we've got some styling and we're doing um, a tags, href, and we've got an asterisk there. So any that's returning JS within the field, if we remove out that asterisk, we're going to see that when we go over to the page and we refresh it, we're going to see that that's removing out the code because it's looking for the entire string within the, the URL. If we went back there and if we left it as that, but we took took the string like that and turn that red and refresh that, you see that it does pick up the one, but it's not picking up the second one. So when we do have that asterisk in there, it's picking up, it's a wild card and it's giving us the ability to pick up all the content. So it doesn't matter what content is written here, it doesn't matter what content is afterwards, as long as it holds this string of characters, JS, it's going to be read. And the reason that we're looking at the styling is because it's going to work the same way within JavaScript. And we just have to remember that we have to bracket out the double quotes with a slash before them so that, because uh, we do have it quoted with double quotes around uh, the query selector. So we don't want to confuse that and break out of our quotes. So we want to make sure that we are including these, uh, these backslash in order to keep those quotes within that uh, within that search parameter because we do want to have it looking the exact same way that it does within the styling uh, and then after that uh, we're going to be just looping through so this should be familiar for you that we're, once we get this object information from the DOM into our variable then we just length we calculate the length of the variable uh, and we loop through it till it's completed and here we've just console logs. We're actually just listing out the HTML values. So that's actually just picking up whatever the inner HTML is. And so this is the previous inner HTML. And then here we're setting a new inner HTML. And what we're doing here is we're going click this link to go to and we're listing out the href value, which is this value here and we're picking that up from the DOM. So going back to the page we can see that it looped through the first one which was everything, the second one was just JS and then it did actually do run the function and changed the content within the inner HTML. So within this we're just gonna erase out this and we're gonna save this as lesson 9 Q and uh, you should be able to download that within the lesson here and work with the code and get that written as we have within this lesson. So previously we've looked at getting elements by ID, getting elements by tag name, and getting elements by the selector. And let's say that uh, within this example we were looking at divs. We didn't want to have to name all these divs, but we did want to be able to access them. So we had a whole bunch of divs without any names, and we want to be able to pick a specific one and get some node information that's available through the DOM API. Uh, so here we, what we did is uh, treating it as if it was an array. Uh, so we're just doing div. So we're selecting get elements by tag name. So we're selecting the divs. And it's the same idea as that when we're looping through all the divs, uh, but we can specify which div we want to isolate and we want to look at. So that's what we've done here in this example that we've gone bracket three bracket. So that's going to look at the fourth div in. So we look here that uh, this is number zero, this is number one, this is number two, and this would be div number three, so then with the fourth one in. So again, starting at zero, uh, always remember that with JavaScript, we're always starting with zero because default is zero. Uh, so let's see if this actually did get selected when we refresh the page. And we can see in the console log that it is spitting out this particular div that's getting highlighted. 
uh, when I'm hovering over it. So we've got a top section, we've got a whole bunch of information that we have access to now because this is available within the DOM itself. And all we're doing is we're just pulling out all the HTML code that's available within it. And so if we want to get a little bit more specific, we see that it's adding in the before, adding in the after. And let's say we want to get more specific and we want to pull out some specific text that's available within this node that's being returned. Just specified all the different child nodes that are available within this node. And when we look at the code there, so we're get elements by tag name, so we're looking at div, fourth div in, we're listing it out above, and here we're being a little bit more specific as to what part of this uh, tag, this node we want to return. So we want to return child nodes, and we're going to return the second one in. So when we look at the second one in, that's going to be this paragraph here, and now we can have access to different text that's available within there. So we're just going to add another child nodes one and we're going to see what the results are going to be. And when we do that, we see that this is the text that's being returned. This is my website, which, so it's returning this particular part. Uh, so it's counting this as the child node, the, the first or the second one that's being returned, so number one. Uh, so there it is, that, that's what's being returned. And then we can break that down even further and uh, look into all the different nodes that are available uh, that are being returned within the DOM. In this example, we're going to be looking at how to access the nodes and attributes that are within the DOM. It's going to get a little bit more interesting than the previous lessons because as you can see here, our output is very limited. So we've got two ordered lists actually on this page. So we've got one here in the navigation menu and then we've got one here within the content. So we wanted to list out all the different, all the text that's available between these these list items and we want to list them out into the console. So what we had to do within the code, we had to get a little bit more specific. Uh, so here is what we're using to pull those out into the console log. So we're using query selector all. We're taking the ID from my list and we're using the list items. So we can see here how it's laid out. So we've got an ordered list, we've got an ID of my list, and then we've got all these different list items. And what we wanted to do is return back the text content from all these list items. So by using query selector, we're able to select all of those items within there. And if you notice within the console log, we're just putting out the first child and then the data from the first child. So if you were just to list this out within console, you would see all the different node items of it that are available that we can actually access through the DOM. And we can see here that they do get listed out. So these are all the child nodes that are available within this particular node. And as you can see here, when we go node first child, that's going to be accessing this one second child, third child, and so on. Different ways to traverse the DOM and select out the data that you're looking for within the DOM. So here we've got collection of children, we've got some information there, as well as we've got next siblings, so we've got some text within there, and we can pick these out individually. So we've actually been going through all the different child nodes when we're listing out within the, the loop here, where we're listing out all the different child nodes. So we're going through zero all the way up to the full length of the child nodes. So if we want to be able to get a listing, so here we've changed out, we're picking up get elements by tag name, so we're looking at ordered lists and 
there's going to be, as we said before, there's two different ordered lists. There's the original one here at the top from the navigation bar, so we don't want to look at that one, but we want to look at the second one. Uh, so it's got an ID of my list, but we're not actually going to be looking by ID as we were down here. We're just going to look at the second ordered list. So once again, uh, remember that with JavaScript, zero is first, one is second, and here we're in the console log, we're just going to list out all the different nodes that are available. And here we're going to specify one specific uh, node that's available. So we're going to go children one. So when we do list that out, we can see that the first one returns all of these, all of this different information. So you can literally access any part of this API of all this data. Uh, so what we went to the next console log is that we went to children and we went to children zero I believe. We'll look back at the code. Uh, yeah, so we went to children zero and we can keep going down and be more and more specific. So we could go child nodes and we could go text and then we could pull out the text information, so the text content. So that's this text content as well as we can kind of look through here and find all the different available nodes that are, are there. Uh, so some of the common ones are next sibling, there's last child, do first child, and so forth. So picking out all the different ones that you want to use, uh, you can pick out the values and return the values of that. So if we went to last child, and then we picked out the, the value there. Picking it like this, so we went ordered list, children, the first child, and uh, then we're picking out the last child that's within their children zero. And what that's going to return, that's going to return this value here. So quite literally the possibilities are endless for what you can be returning when you're looking through the DOM. So in this lesson, we're going to be looking at how to change styles just by using JavaScript and manipulating the DOM. So here's my new header, and uh, this is different than the previous one that I had. So now we're going to just look at the code that's uh, making this happen. Uh, so I've got header elements. I'm getting element by ID. I'm selecting out header. So that's all the way over here. My original text within the header is welcome to my website. And so what I'm doing is I'm changing the inner HTML. I'm changing the color to blue. I'm changing the background color to yellow. And I'm changing the font family. And I'm adding a border, a black border. And if you notice, a lot of this is just regular CSS. So you've got your color. And this is just all standard CSS tagging. The only one that is different is background color. So in CSS, it's not written out this way. So if you do try that, it's not going to work. Uh, so you do want to make sure that you are using um, background and you're not putting in that, uh, that dash that you would within CSS. Uh, you want to make sure that you are doing camel case where you're doing an upper case letter and so you're doing the first word upper case of the second word and then setting out a different color, uh, color that you want to change it to. Challenges uh, for the next set of code you can actually just use this one here lesson 12 we're not going to actually write out a challenge for this one because uh, this one is just to practice out all the different CSS styling abilities select different areas within the HTML code and just update the styling. So maybe put some borders around the images, select out different, uh, different rows, maybe by class, and uh, change some styling for that. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of options and a whole bunch of different things you can do. Uh, we're going to quickly upload something where we have made some changes. 
Uh, but that is the challenge for the next lesson. So you can take lesson 12 and just play around with the code within this, uh, with this lesson, the source file. So the challenge for this example is going to be to change all the different class rows to have a red background, to have a black border, and to center the text as well as to change the text color to blue. So if you remember in the last example we were working through how to change select a particular div uh, div by ID and change the background, change the text and add some styling elements. So this is going to be very similar. So if you want to download lesson number 13 and work with the code that's available within there and uh, just loop through that and find all the different class rows and then set all this different CSS elements uh, using JavaScript. So our solution here that's written out is to select out by class name row. So I just uh, quickly change that. So row element is get elements by class name row. So it's going to select all the different class equals row all the way through the HTML code on the web page. So then we're going to loop through it. Uh, so using the array that we had looked at before, the looping of it, uh, we loop through all the different items that are available within this uh, this particular element. Uh, and then here we're setting text align center. Uh, and then this is just similar to the previous code that we were looking at where we're changing the color of the font. We've got the background to red font family, we're manipulating that, and we're adding a border as well. So once again, that's to manipulate how the website's going to look and just completely change everything around. So now that we've gone through all the different styles that we can change with uh, JavaScript, you're probably thinking to yourself, well there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a way to just be able to just change the entire class or add classes and luckily there actually is with uh, JavaScript. So what you can do is, so I've set a style here, I'm just calling it new style and I've got a lot of the same stuff that I had in the previous lesson. And what I'm doing here is I'm just doing the query selector all. So I'm selecting all the class, anyone that has a row a class row within it and I'm looping through all of them and I'm adding class name to it and I'm just class name and then the actual name of the class so make sure that you do have that within the CSS styling and that's how you can add in the different class names and completely change the classes that are being accessed within the HTML code so to answer the next question that you're probably thinking, so what we're actually doing here is we're removing the class name row and replacing it with new style. So that probably isn't going to work that great for you. Um, so we probably want to actually, instead of swapping out the styles, the classes, we want to actually add in this class. So all we have to do is just do a plus sign and without the plus sign, so I did add in some different CSS here. So I've broken up row to have a border and I've added new style just as it was before. And when we refresh the page, we see that all the borders are gone because that class is being overwritten and we've got a whole new class there. So what we want to do, it's very simple. We're just going to add in a plus there and we're going to make sure that we've added in that space and refresh the page and now we can see that we're actually holding both the classes in each one of these different sections and when we inspect the element we can still see that we've got the class available so we've got the class of row as well as we've added in the new class new style so it's adding in both of them so all we had to do is just add that plus sign and that allows us to add additional class names into the HTML code previous video we talked about working with class names. So if we have a list here and if we want to add an additional item, list item within this list, using JavaScript to do this. 
So essentially what we want to do, we want to add list item ID list F class, list class, have the text within it, say list F. So it just matches in with what we've got up here in our ordered list. So the code to, in order to do that, first we're going to create, we're going to get element by, I, by ID. So that's using the list here. So the UL tag ID the list. So we're placing that as a variable UL. And then now we're using LI and we're creating element LI. So that cre actually creates an additional LI element. And now we have to position it. So we're going to append create node. And what we're doing here, we're actually creating text node. So we're placing in that text here. So right now at this point, what we have is we have it listed out like this. We don't have an ID for it. Uh, so we've got li list f closed li. And then with this additional one, we're attaching an ID to it. So we're setting attribute ID and we're calling it list f. So that would be this one here. And then finally we're adding in the class which is the list class and then we're doing another append child and in this one we're appending the child onto the U UL list so that was element by ID the list and what all of this does together when we save it and we refresh it we see that it adds an additional item in the list and if we look at the inspecting the elements of it we see that it does match in with the rest of the list where it's got list F class, list class, and then the text in the middle is list F. Another thing you can do within the DOM API for JavaScript is you can get image information. So when you click on an image, you can pick up some information off this image. Uh, here we've got listed out the same Loramel pixel. Uh, they're all the same height, but in this one, in the middle one here, we've, we're setting a height of 400 and width of 200. And then down below, we're using styling to set a height of 300 and a width of 100. And just below all three images, we're listing out the image information. So image, the first image, uh, we're checking to see the height and the width, and we're not picking up anything. Uh, the second image, we're doing height and width and we're able to pick up that 400 by 200. Uh, so style, there's no information for the style. And then in the last one, we're picking up the height and the width. And we see that within the style, we get a height of 300 and a width of 100. So it's actually getting that information from the style and it's pulling it over into height and width. So when we look at the code for this, what we're doing here, We've got the three images there. And as you can see, the differences are the same as when we're doing the inspect element, where the first one, there's no height or width set. And that, uh, and also uh, the JavaScript isn't able to pull up any information on that. In the second image, we're setting it, we've got an ID of IMA2, and we've got a height of 400 and a width of 200. And then in the third one, we're actually setting it by style, so height and width of 300 by 100. And then with the JavaScript, uh, so we've got all of these, uh, we're setting up an array here, we're getting element by ID, so we could also pick through and we could set these as well. Uh, so this, in this example, we're just picking up the element by ID, so we're picking up the ID name and we're getting that information in that way. And then this line of code, object output, uh, so this is just picking up where our output space is. So that was where we're outputting the information that we've picked up from the images uh, through JavaScript. And here we're starting out um, the string. So we're gonna make it an ordered list of images. Uh, so we're opening up the UL and here we're closing that UL. And here we're looping through all the images within the array. So it's gonna list through all three of these and it's just gonna pick up image it's going to tell us which i value plus one, so we're not starting at zero. And uh, then we've got a height, we've got a width, 
and then we've got the style height and style width and you can see here that through JavaScript through the API we're able to pick up the height and the width of that array image so it coincides with the array images that are there as well as we're able to look at style height and style width and when we're using the second one there is no style height or style width uh, but when we're using the third one here it picks up the height and width as the same as width here and height here within style and then it's outputting that uh, information in the string HTML just added in the console log here so we can get some information on what's being output and when I refresh it and we look in the console we can see what's actually being picked up within the element there and we see that this is the same as the HTML code that we were using. You get image information using JavaScript using the DOM API. In this video we'll be talking about event listeners, adding event listeners. So this is the part that's going to get really interesting, uh, making your web really interactive as it's going to be waiting for user input and depending on what action the user is taking uh, this is going to react within the JavaScript and then the DOM is going to do some kind of action according to what's happened with the user interaction. Uh, so, so far on this example we've set up button A and when we click the button it says that we clicked the first button. So I'm just going to have to refresh that and you see that once the button is clicked it changes the text up here and it detects that this button has been clicked. So when we go to the code, it's relatively easy to set up. Uh, you just have to pick up the ID there. So the ID of the button is button A, and then we've got the output ID there. So that's just output. And we can see here, this is where we're outputting the, the text, and this is the button that we're adding the event listener on. Uh, so here is the button click. So this is a function that's going to fire that we're going to once the event listener is clicked. Uh, so this is just a simple function where we're using this my output and we're just putting text content in that my output area. And here is where we're adding the event listener and adding an event listener so anytime that particular event takes place. So if there's a click on the my button, it's going to fire off this function button click. And that's exactly what's happening within our example. When we do click the button, it's waiting for an event to happen. So it's listening for that event to take place. And once we do click and we do act upon that event, then it runs through the function that is assigned to that event. In the previous lesson, we had looked at adding event listeners when a button gets clicked and you want some kind of action to take place. And in this example, in this challenge, we're going to be asking to change the output text to show the ID of the button that was clicked. So we want to have multiple buttons, so all three of these buttons that should be clickable. And what it should do is it should write out what is the ID of this button. So we go to inspect element, we can see that this button, it's going to move that down a little bit. So this might be a little bit small on your screen, but you can see that we do have it called button CBTNC is the ID. Uh, so when we click this one, this is BTNB and this is BTNA. We can see that available within the source file as well. Uh, the button IDs A, button BTNB and BTNC. And once they get clicked, we just want this output text to be displayed. Now, if you want to pause the video and try to take up the challenge, we do have external source file where you can work with the file, the file code that we're using within this lesson. Uh, just download, or you can download lesson 18 and uh, just lesson18.html, and that will hold the code without the ability to change the buttons. So I'll just show you that. So this one doesn't have any of the buttons changing and this is the code you can work with and if you do get stuck and you want to see the answer we're going to have that within lesson 18a lesson 18a.html which is going to be within the source files that uh, we've got available within the course.
So when we open up lesson 18a, now we're just going to go through the answer. And what we had to do, we changed it from get element by ID to get elements by class name. Uh, so this would pick up any, any object that would have a class name BTN. So we're looking for all, we're placing that, all of them within the my button object array. And then we're, what we're doing, we're just attaching them, my output here, get element by ID, which we've done before. And here we've added in a function, a button click function, and we're changing the my output text content to you clicked and this ID. And the way that we're adding the event listeners, we still have to add each event listener individually, but the good thing about it is that we can actually loop through this object array that we have for my button and assign all the different event listeners that way. And because we want to use the same function for the event listener, because we want to have the same output here, uh, and it's just going to vary. We're going to pick up the, the different information that's coming in from the my button object, and we're just going to use uh, pick up the ID element information. So looping through, adding all the event listeners, attaching that all the different event listeners would have the button click function. Uh, so you can also do this if you wanted to separate it out by element by ID, but this is a much cleaner way to do that and attaching them all to the same function and when button click btn click gets fired it runs this function and it selects my output text content and sets it as you clicked gets the id from the my button object of array information and says this uh, this is where you can use this uh, so this would pertain to the current open object, so this and picking up the ID. And that's how we're getting, uh, how we're solving this challenge. And once again, open up lesson 18.html and work with the content within there. And if you get stuck for the solution, we've got the solution in 18a HTML. In the previous lesson, we had looked at event listeners and adding one event listener to the page. So ultimately, you probably want to have more than one event listener and you want to have a whole bunch of different functions. So in this example, we're going to be switching these buttons over to classes and we're going to listen on classes. And we can see here that depending on the button that's clicked, we see that you clicked button A, button B, and button C. So the way that we're accomplishing this within the code, so we did change the buttons to classes so that we can get all of them within one variable there. So by getting elements by class name, so putting it into that array type object where we can go through all the different button lengths and then pull out uh, the buttons via the value within the array and then doing an add event listener and then the same thing that we did before where we're doing click and calling the function button click. And this is the button click function, so it's very similar to what we had been doing before. Uh, so there's just a slight change with, instead of getting element by ID, we're getting element, elements by class name, and the class name is button. So it's tying all of those within one event, and we still have to have separate listeners for each event. Uh, so keeping that in mind, we go through the array and we list out these uh, event listeners. So they're all listening for clicks. Uh, so it doesn't matter which one gets clicked as long as the class name is button. And then it fires off button click function. And the button click function uh, goes you clicked. And you see here this. Uh, so this indicates that this is this particular item, object, that is being looked at so we're looking at this ID and that's how we're identifying the current one uh, so we can actually just use that one text content there using this ID and it will pull out all the different IDs coinciding with the my button add event listener 
And that's how you can build up additional functionality without having additional code or a whole bunch of additional code. Uh, you can reuse content that you've, functions that you've already created. In the previous example, we were looking at event listeners. So when we clicked something, when the user actually did a, a click, it outputs something different. Uh, so we're working with the buttons. In this example, we're going to be talking about how to detect mouse events and even find out where the mouse is located on the screen. So you see here, when I'm hovering over the image, we're looking for mouse events when the, when the user is over the image. And when we open this up within the console there, we see that we've got a whole bunch of information here that we can work with. So this is all within the browser DOM and we can pick out different pieces of information such as the X, the Y, we can screen X, screen Y, we can pick up the offset information, layer X, layer Y, so we can have a whole bunch of coordinate information that we can use and that's actually what we're returning here. If we look at the code you can see that we're returning X and we're returning Y and that's what the output that's being displayed so when we are hovering over the image, you can see here in our output area that the X is at 317 and Y is at 615. And then that does change depending on where we're located on the image. As soon as we go off the image, it uh, stops picking up where we're located. And the reason for that is that we're using my image ID as the my mouse area and the my mouse area has an event listener and the event listener is mouse move so whenever the mouse moves on top of this id element it's going to trigger the event listener which is going to be triggering the function what we are calling mouse mover and then this function is going to fire and here in the console we've got all of the function items that are being listed. Uh, so that was all of these things that we're looking at where it says mouse event. So that was just console E and then when we go console E X that picks up the X coordinate and then we're also outputting it here so we're just saying E X and E Y. So we're just picking up that information that was being returned, that mouse event information and we're looking at X and Y coordinates. And then all we had to do for the image, uh, we didn't actually change anything, so we just using the ID there, so it's my image, and then that's tying it all together. So this lesson is going to be a challenge lesson. Uh, we're looking at lesson 20.html, so that's going to be the source file for this lesson. And the object of this uh, challenge is to change the background and text of output ID div when the user moves mouse on and off of the image. So the image that we're using is just my image and when the user moves their mouse on and off of my, my image, uh, we're adding an event listener that's going to pick up that the mouse is moving and when the mouse is on top of the my image, it's going to fire off one type of event listener function and then once it stops moving or once it's off of the image it's going to fire off a different event and so the output is here and basically what this is going to look like is when we go on top of the image you see that it goes red and the text goes you are over the image when I go off of it you moved off the image so this is what we want to accomplish for the challenge and if you want to download this force source file and you can take a lot of hints from the previous lesson where we're using the event listener so we had mouse move uh, so it would just be a matter of changing the event listener and adding an additional event listener so if you want to pause the video or if you want to watch through and watch what our solution is and as well don't forget to try it yourself and just to see if you can get it working as well so our solution is available actually within lesson 20a and here we basically have the output 
the my mouse we're going to include that within lesson 20 as well and what we've done is we've written two different functions so we're going to include those as well within that lesson and so all you have to do is just create the event listeners and then attach each function or each method uh, once the event listener can fire so adding in my mouse add event listener and we're lo looking at mouse move and mouse leave and then it's firing off those methods that coincide the functions that coincide with the event listener So in this lesson, we're looking at forms and using the DOM within the form. And this actually is going to show you how powerful the DOM can really be when you do start working with forms. Uh, so this particular form, we've just hooked up the name field there. And what happens when you click this, if there's no data within the name field, then it's just going to say, mysterious person, I wonder why you don't add your name. So if you do have a name, and if you click it, it goes hello name. And what it's essentially doing, it's picking up the value from within that form field and when you click the button, uh, it runs that event listener and puts out text in the output area up at the top. And the code for this is, as before, we're just setting up our output area. We're looking for element by ID submit button, so just as before. And what we're doing, we're adding an event listener, so it's a click and once it gets clicked button click sends to the button click function and here we're declaring a value of message out uh, and we're using the value here because uh, we've got an if statement uh, so it's one of the reasons that we set a variable there as well as if you've got some additional if statements or other functions methods that you're going to be operating with uh, it's always a good idea to have one message area uh, if you're returning information out to it that you can manipulate fairly easily by just typing in that uh, message out and then just typing in the value that you want attached to it. Uh, so we've attached first name and if you look over here on the right of it uh, we're just looking for the value and what this is going to do this is going to look at the get element by ID first name look at that field and pick up whatever value is available within that field and if there's no value in name it's gonna display oh if there is a value in name it's gonna display hello name so it's gonna take that name value and go hello plus that name value and if there's nothing if there's no value for name it's gonna go message out mysterious person I wonder why you don't add your name and then over here it just outputs the content. So in this lesson we're going to be going over a challenge. Uh, so it's going to contain code from lesson 22 HTML and the solution is going to be at 22A HTML. So what we want to do within this challenge is this is going to be very common for you when you're writing up forms you've got an email address and put in an email address and you want to make sure that it validates so if maybe they've left out something from that email address you want to have it that it's um, it's not going to validate as an email address so in this form it's just submitting it because it doesn't have a validation check but over here we type in that same email address which actually isn't an email address and we click that some name you need a valid email so here it's actually detecting that we need the email address and whereas here it's um, it's just not detecting anything uh, so we want to try to find out how we can set up that it's going to detect if this is a valid email address and of course a valid email address needs to have this format where they've got the at symbol and then dot com or uh, dot that this kind of pattern within it and here we see that uh, thanks some some name your email is valid 
So if we look at the code we had looked at earlier in lesson 21, we picked up to see if name existed and if it did exist then we do hello name. Uh, so we want to do something kind of similar to this where we've got a statement and we're looking for uh, so everything here is the same up until we get to this point. And this is where we have to run the if statement to check if we do have a valid email address. Now one of the easiest ways to do this is just to check for a pattern and match the pattern within that address and then run a test on it. Uh, so you can do that by establishing the pattern here. So here it's checking for the at symbol, here it's checking for the period. Uh, so as long as it meets this criteria, so it's got the content, at, content, or string, dot, string, it's going to match the criteria that we need for an email address. And when we do, we use, so we set it as re, and if we do re dot test, it's actually going to run that test to see if variable email or get element by ID email value matches this test. And if it does, then it does thanks name, your email is valid. And if it doesn't match the test, then it's going to go uh, the person's name, so it's going to pick up the name. You need a valid email. So, what you should do. Uh, go to lesson 22, the HTML code, and try to set up that, that check there to make sure that's a valid email. And if you get stuck on that, you can always open up lesson 22A uh, to get the actual code that we're using that solves this challenge. Within this lesson, we're going to be talking about preventing a default method from firing. So, by definition, a default method, if you have a link and you click that link, it'll go out to the link, brings you to a new web page by default. So what we want to do, instead of having that link fire off, as we do down here, we're preventing the default action, the default method from taking place. So when we click this, we see that nothing happens. But although we are tracking it within the console log, so when we do click it, we're writing out into the console log that it was clicked. So we know that we are actually clicking the button, but it doesn't look like it's actually taking us to the link. And the way that we've removed that link action, and this is for cases where you might not necessarily want to link out to the website. You might want to have some JavaScript in the middle that would be tracking it or doing something with that code so you don't want that default link action to take place if you're using the especially if you're using the a href tags um, the hyperlink tags you might not want to have this action taking place and the way to do that to remove that action from taking place is to do it with JavaScript so here we're just getting element by ID we're picking up this is the ID uh, my website we're adding event listener so if it does get clicked it's going to fire off this function. So our event listener is going to be listening when the user goes over and clicks this hyperlink. It's not going to actually, it's going to go to the JavaScript first. Uh, so JavaScript will take priority over the HTML code. So whatever the HTML code says, JavaScript does take priority over that. Uh, so if you do have a click before that, you're going to always be able to pull in this, uh, this click first. Uh, so even if you do leave remove out this prevent default, you can actually um, you can actually track through the clicks or whatever you need to do within the JavaScript as well. Uh, so there it functions the event and it's doing preventing the default and that's all you really have to do just go event prevent default and that will disable the default event from firing when it's clicked within the HTML. And then we've just got console log clicked, and we're just adding that in. And if you want to know more about what you can do with events, uh, so here we're using this event, uh, and we've got it within console log. And when we refresh the page, we see that 
I guess we have to click this uh, button in order to see that. Uh, so clicking that, uh, first we're tracking in the event in the console log and wow again there's a whole bunch of stuff here that uh, useful information that you could use within JavaScript and work with that. Um, so this is all the information that we're picking up and uh, we're just preventing the, the default. So here is what we're setting. Default prevented is true. Uh, so by default, default prevented is false. But here we've set it to true with that, uh, with that call there. So we've set it to true. And then that's disabling that, um, that H hyperlink click. We're going to be talking about the window, window properties, and window methods. Uh, so as you can see here, we've console logged the window. And just so we can see all the window information when we go open up the page in the console log. And you see within the window, there's a whole ton. There's just tons of information there. The API is returning back a whole bunch of nodes that you can work with and that you can use. And you see all the different functions listed out. Uh, so there's a lot that you can do just within the window. And just below that, so we, we've picked out a few of the object properties. So we can pick up height, so we can do screen height, we can do scroll X, we can do history length, we can do location, and we can do navigator user agent. So this is actually fairly popular when you're trying to pick up if it's a mobile device. Uh, to pick up the user agent and that gives you some more information about what type of device is accessing it. Uh, so over here we see that I'm using Chrome. Uh, so it is fairly long form uh, and you do have to scan for particular words within there to be able to detect what, uh, what device and what browser is being used. As well we've got the screen, I believe it was uh, screen width uh, and then we've got a zero, which was scroll X, so it's not scrolled. Uh, and we've got four as the history length, so there's four items within the history. And then we've just uh, printing out the location there, uh, so that's window location. And there's just literally a whole bunch of information that you can pick up and you can use that's available right within the window. Uh, so there's also what's called object methods. So these are actually more functional type items where we're opening up a window and we're giving it a width of zero, a height of, I mean a width of 100, a height of 100, and then that opened window we're resizing it to 250 by 250. Uh, here just below we're setting intervals, so that's also within the window object methods, and we're setting an interval so what's here, we're running a function and it's a console log uh, function so what we're doing is we're setting a message that will show every five seconds and here we've got our timer so this is in milliseconds so 5000 milliseconds is five seconds and when we close that up we can actually see that it is firing off every five seconds uh, so this, this particular one is firing off. We've got our pop-ups blocked so I'm just going to unblock that and now that that's unblocked, when we re do reload the page, we should have the window popping up. We're, here we had that window that was set within the window method, or the object methods, uh, and that's the window that popped up, and then we're able to resize it as well. So these are going to be uh, useful useful ob uh, properties, objects that you can work with that are available within the window itself through the DOM API. The last lesson we talked about setting intervals and having a repeated interval. Uh, so this kind of stuff where you've got blinking text, uh, you can fairly easily accomplish uh, within the set interval option. And this text we've got set to blink until this button gets clicked. Uh, so whatever, whenever the button gets clicked, so whatever it was on, if it was on red, it will stay red. If it was on black, it will stay black. So if I reload that again, and I'll see if I can get it to stop on black, and that's stopping on black. 
Uh, so it's it's a set interval, and what it's doing, it's running through and it's changing the color of uh, this div information here, this div text. And when we look at the code, so this is just our standard output that we've been using. Uh, we added in the H1 tags to make it a little bit bigger and more visible. And here we've uh, set out Blinky, which is our variable. Uh, we're adding the button, so we're going to add a vent listener on that button. So when the button gets clicked, we're going to be able to run our function. So submit button, once again, the same one that we used before. And here we're initiating Blinky. So we're setting that interval to change text uh, every 100 uh, milliseconds. So about, I guess, 10 times per second. It's going to be changing and blinking that text. Uh, so what it is, it's running this function, change text. And here's the function that's, uh, that's changing the text. So when we click the button, we've got another function to stop changing the text, and all we do here is we clear the interval. So we set the interval, and when we want to stop it, we just clear the interval. And the interval is blinky, so it's being set here as blinky, and here we're clearing it. Uh, and then the rest of it is fairly straightforward, where we're setting a variable my output, and we're attaching it to that get element by ID output ID and we're putting my output style color and what we're doing here if it's red um, it's going to go to black and by default it's going to go to red and this will allow us to kind of toggle through and switch through between red and black colors uh, so all we're doing here is setting the style that's going to be displayed out within that web page this video we're going to be taking what we did within the prior videos at prior course lessons and we're going to be applying it to create animations so what we've done here we've attached event listeners to the two buttons there we've created a div and we've set it as an absolute position setting it at zero absolute position and when we click start we can see that the box starts moving when we click stop it stops and then start once again reinitiates it back to the original spot and continues it moving and stop just stops it from moving and the code that we're using to create this here we're just getting ele get element by ID animated so animated is our actual box there and we've also you can see that we've set position 0 we've set it as a left position 10 top 100 padding 50 uh, so these are just the, the style that we set for animated and here we've got our animated moving box uh, and here we've got the start and stop so we just put in these on click functions right within the button so when the button gets pressed it runs as JavaScript on click so we've got start and stop there going down to the different functions so we've got one function for starting we've got one function for stopping once the start function uh, gets run, we pick up the start time, which is date.now. We get the requested request ID, which is window request animation frame render. So this is relatively new. If you are using request animation frame, uh, you have to check in and just make sure that your browser is or the browsers that you're looking to use this on are going to be compatible but request animation frame has made it very easy to create animations within uh, within the DOM so window request animation frame and what we're doing is we're rendering it and when we render we run this function here so we're getting the time and we're checking to see if the variable is stopped if it's uh, true or not and then what we're doing is we're doing style left and we're calculating out where the pixels so on an increase because uh, we're taking the date now and we're minusing the start time so this number will continue to increase as the date increases and our start time stays the same so that's why we're able to subtract it get a value divided by 8 so changing 8 will also change the speed of it uh, if we make it smaller I believe we're gonna go faster if we make it larger we're gonna go slower so just check that quickly yeah so that made it go uh, quicker 
because of course the number of pixels is going to increment uh, faster at that rate. So we'll just set it back to 8 and then all we're doing is we're just rendering out um, window request animation frames. So we're using request ID there and uh, we're rendering that out once again. And if it's stop, it just cancel animation frame and tying it back to the request ID and setting it all back to zero.